The fugue is one of the most important compositional styles of the Baroque era, and one which composers of today still borrow elements from. It is a must-have for your composition repertoire. So what is a fugue? It is a work of polyphonic textual writing, consisting of overlapping and interacting melodic lines. It is based on a short theme called a subject, and can be written for any number of voices, but usually around three to five. It is mostly written for keyboard instruments like a harpsichord or the organ. To understand how a fugue really works, let's examine a work from the master of fugue himself, J.S. Bach. His little fugue in G minor was written for organ. The opening of a fugue is really the only composition element where there are rules we must follow. Beyond that, we're free to experiment. For our purposes, we will only examine the opening section of the fugue, the exposition. Here is an overview of Bach's exposition. When talking about the different ranges and roles of melodic layers, we use the language of the four main vocal ranges, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. The subject appears once in each of these vocal ranges. When the subject is heard for the first and third times, it is in the original key of G minor. When it appears for the second and fourth times, it is stated in a different key and is known as the answer. Lastly, in a fugue, we don't harmonize this subject with chords like in a homophonic texture, but rather, we want to create a polyphonic texture by writing a melody at the same time as the subject, shown here in green, known as the counter subject. Let's take a look at Bach's subject. We notice from the key signature, the starting and ending notes, and the raised seventh of F sharp, that it is in G harmonic minor. Now, even though when we first hear the theme, it is in a solo voice to start off with, when you write your subject, you should have an idea of the harmonization you will use to, when you write it. Bach's theme implies simple tonic to dominant chords. Here it is. After the subject is first stated, it is repeated down a fourth into the dominant scale of D harmonic minor. This is sometimes known as the answer. This appears in the alto voice range. Note the use of accidentals of the raised seventh of C sharp and the E natural to fit in with the D harmonic minor scale. The third statement of the subject is heard in the original key, except this time Bach starts the subject on the third beat of the bar. This is stated in the tenor voice range. Our last iteration of the subject answer will appear in the bass voice range, or the pedals of the organ in the little fugue, and will again be in the dominant key. We now get to the fun part of writing some polyphony. Remember that the counter subject first appears above or below the subject answer. Just a reminder that this is in the dominant scale, and your two-part writing should follow the harmonic progression that you first write when you write your subject. The most important part about writing a fugue is to maintain part independence. You don't just want to fill space, but rather, you want to create a cohesive melodic line that could stand on its own. We can do that rhythmically by using complementary rhythms in the other part. This may mean not using rhythmic unison, parts with the same rhythmic value, and not having empty space when there are longer note durations occurring at the same time. This disrupts the forward motion of your fugue. Harmonically, we need to observe a few rules of counterpoint. Namely, the more imperfect consonances we can use, the better, i.e. major or minor, thirds and sixths. These will help outline the horizontal chordal movement. Because perfect intervals like a fifth or an octave don't have quality, meaning that they can't be major or minor, as a result, they don't give us that sense of the chord and ruin the strength of our harmonic progression. The golden rule is to never use octaves or fifths in succession. Instead, follow each with an imperfect consonance like a third or a sixth. Here is Bach's counter subject, stated first in the soprano voice. Notice the use of complementary rhythms throughout, creating that Baroque spirit of rhythmic momentum. Bach 
Bach keeps his melodic lines interesting with sequences and patterns. As we can see in the third bar, we have this semiquaver pattern where the top three notes stay the same and the bottom changes, providing a moving harmony with the subject answer below. In the next bar, he then changes and inverts this idea to have the top note changing in a similar direction. Now taking a closer look at Bach's two-point counterpoint, we can see some of our guidelines in play. Remember that Bach is using simple tonic to dominant harmony. As this is the subject answer, we're in D harmonic minor, so those chords will be D minor and A major or A7. I've reduced the compound intervals of, for example, a tenth to simple intervals of a third. As we can see, Bach mostly uses imperfect consonances. Where Bach has to use perfect intervals, he follows it by an imperfect and never any consecutive fifths or octaves. So we've now covered the two most important elements in the exposition of the fugue, the subject, the subject answer, and the counter subject. We are now going to listen through the rest of the exposition. Before we do, let's notice some new features. Bach has inserted a short transition passage between the statements of the subject answer and the tenor statement of the subject. This effectively acts as a modulating passage back to the tonic key, but also breaks up the repeating nature of hearing the subject continually. We also notice that because this is a keyboard fugue, by the time we get to the counter subject to the tenor subject, it is the same counter subject melody, but shared between two voices, soprano and alto. Lastly, when the bass is making the last statement of the subject answer, the soprano introduces a third melodic line to the texture. Now let's have a listen. Try to follow the subject in blue and note the new features also. So that's Bach's exposition. After this, composers go on to develop the subject in short episodes, fragmenting and developing the melodic ideas of the exposition and moving through a range of keys. Creating your own exposition is a good exercise. Start with writing a subject. So this can be as short as two beats or up to eight bars in length, but it's probably best to aim for a two bar subject to start out with. You then want to transpose it into the dominant key to create your answer. Now that you have the subject and answer, you can arrange them into the four voices of a keyboard or an ensemble. I suggest to start off with a string quartet or a woodwind or brass quartet. That way you don't have to worry about the added complexity of making sure your four voices can be played on a keyboard with two hands. So this can be in any order. Arrange them into the subject, answer, subject, answer. If you want to get fancy, you can create a short modulating passage like Bach did between the answer and coming back to the subject. You then want to create some chords underneath your subject. To help you, I suggest writing the chords out in both the tonic and dominant keys for your reference. Use this harmony to then create a counter subject to go over your answer. Remember to observe the principles of counterpoint that we explored in this video. Copy this counter subject into the third voice and continue the melodic work of the second voice. Note that Bach sometimes cuts out some voices to create space and interest. Four voices all going on at the same time is a little too much polyphony for the listener to handle. So don't feel you have to keep all the parts going. That ends your exposition. Good luck and thanks for watching.